Welcome to CounterPoint. I'm Tanya Granick allen Do you pay attention to politics? And not just changes to laws, but the actual politics of it all. Politics is defined as the art or science of government or governing. And yes, there is an art and science to it. What do the polls say? What people shape this country? Who is whispering in which politician's ear? How are leaders of the party selected? Who develops the party policies? Who is the puppet master? There is usually a lot of politics in the lead up to an election. Plenty of policies decided upon and organizers are busy promoting their political brand. But what happens just after an election, as in now? Things tend to become tumultuous, especially for leaders and parties who fail to make any serious, serious gains. Today we're going to discuss what's happening in politics post-federal election, especially within the federal conservatives and the Green Party. We're going to discuss which leaders are staying, which are going, and which have already gone. We're also going to cover what is happening in Alberta politics as well as the upcoming provincial Ontario election. What should we expect? What issues will dominate? And joining me now in studio to help me unpack it all is Vonnie Sweetland, conservative organizer and commentator. Bonnie, thank you so much for joining me today in studio. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. It's always a different dynamic when we have a guest <laughs> sitting here because usually I interview you over Zoom. Yes, you know what? We've all been doing Zoom during the pandemic, but I'm happy to be here in person. Excellent. Okay, well, we have a lot to discuss, and I know you pay probably just as much, if not more, attention to what's <laughs> happening behind the scenes politically. But we just wrapped up a federal election several weeks ago. Okay. There's a little bit of a, you know, calming, cooling off period, but immediately the knives seem to come out for those parties or leaders who, you know, again, fail to miss the mark. What do you see? What kind of grounds are shifting that you've observed? Well, look, it doesn't surprise me at all. As you just said, the ground starts to shift, knives come out. You get a lot of people, especially in parties that are big tent, that will come out and say, look, I don't like the outcome. I think we need something different. And it usually happens immediately after, especially if your party did not win. And so we do see that happening in the CPC. We clearly have seen a lot of turmoil in the Green Party as well. So I think more to come. Now, when you said you definitely see this in parties that are big tent. Explain what big tent means in politics. Big tent meaning there are a multitude of different viewpoints, a multitude of perspectives. So in the Conservative Party, you have people who consider themselves social conservatives. You have people who consider themselves fiscal conservatives. You have people who consider themselves progressive conservatives. All of these different groups don't always gel together. Sometimes they have varying points of view. Right. I suppose if uh, someone who's only interested in fiscal policy starts wading into more social policy, then you have the big social divide and debate that might happen. Exactly. And so what we see when that happens is all of these different perspectives trying to fit together, but in occasion, on occasion having trouble. But the good news is political parties should be or ought to be a microcosm of, of Canada. Yes. Uh, we have... From coast to coast to coast, yeah. we have Canadians of all sorts of different opinions, and a party should really truly be respective of, or re representative, if you will, of, of yeah. those opinions. So Different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. Yeah, socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, social views, fiscal views, uh, world views, for that matter. You all know, of that. A lot of people have escaped tyrannies, totalitarian states, communist states, come to Canada as immigrants. They don't want to see any of that here. So if there's a party that's kind of catering more to say, a dictator crowd, they're not going to be too happy, are they? Not at all, not at all. And that's one of the beauties of being here in Canada. We've got a multitude of different parties. Parties have a lot of different voices inside of them so that they can advocate for the people who are following and supporting them. Now, I want to unpack specifics as to what's going on with some of these federal parties. But one complaint I hear often as a conservative is that there is no difference with the parties. They're all sort of become the same. Yeah. Do you still see marked differences within each federal party? 100%, absolutely. You look at fiscal policy, and there's a huge difference between the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party. Just as an example, we see here that the federal Liberals are spending a lot of money. There's been money printing. This has led to inflation. It's been driving up the cost of living for all Canadians, also Ontarians here in Ontario. We know that that's an issue. Conservatives are very fiscally responsible, just by, by principle always have been. And so when you look at something like this, you say there is a stark difference between how conservatives would be leading government right now if they were in power versus how the liberals are leading government. Maybe with the exception of the carbon taxation, though, because even the conservatives did have a carbon taxation policy. Yes. Well, look, I will just say this. I've spoken with several leading experts 
in the green sector, if you will. And all of them have told me personally that a carbon tax is 100% needed to successfully combat climate change. I think the Conservative Party has realized that and as such came forward with the, the policy that we recently seen unveiled. Welcome back. We're discussing and unpacking politics, federal politics, provincial politics, and what's sort of happening behind the scenes, especially as we've wrapped up the recent federal election. And joining me here in studio, which is such a pleasure, is Vonnie Sweetland, conservative organizer and commentator. Again, Vonnie, thanks so much for coming in today. Uh, before commercial break, we were discussing some of the factions, if you will, within any major political party, but especially the Conservative Party. So let's talk about that a little bit more detailed now. Sure. You say there's fiscal conservatives, social conservatives, and I know I'm, I'm a conservative myself. Uh, and then I guess, I don't know, I call, figure myself an all-encompassing all conservative, but I don't know if there's such thing yet. <laughs> What is happening right now with Aaron O'Toole? We've seen headlines that, you know, there's some group starting a petition or there's some national council doing something. So what's happened in those days just after the uh, election of 2021? Well, unfortunately, we have seen some unrest within the party. Again, not all across the party, but within certain factions. We did have a national council member who launched a petition who wanted a leadership review sooner than 2023. That has obviously caused some dismay amongst party members. And what's a leadership review for our voters, or for our viewers, rather? A leadership review is essentially an opportunity to litigate the leader, in this case, Erin O'Toole's performance during the election. The Constitution does provide for that to happen in 2023. Some folks are saying, look, we don't want to wait until 2023. We want to have it now. Because it's a minority government, right? Trudeau won a minority government again. So at any point, technically, yes. the, the election could happen. Now, do we foresee it happening in the next calendar year? Probably not, but perhaps in two years. So I can understand uh, how the membership might say, okay, well, or do we have the, the, the right leader going to lead us into the next election? For sure. I'll just say this. On every single great sports team, we know that after a loss, especially a, a very passionate loss where, you know, emotions are, are flying, teams will then say, look, we've got to start looking internally and we've got to look at all of our team players and ask, could the goalie have done a better job? Could our forward have scored more goals? That is natural. But the most successful teams know that the way to be successful is to work together and unify, not to start pointing the finger. So my perspective is whether you were pleased with the outcome or not, right now is a time to keep the target, if you will, target, <laughs> on your political opponents and not turning it inside. Okay, but it's a recipe for disaster. And I, I still want to focus opinion. on the federal, but you know, I was a candidate when there was a sudden leadership, snap leadership in, in Ontario. And we, the Conservatives, won in Ontario with mere weeks to go before the election, even with changing uh, the focus for, for several months and electing a new leader. So it can be done. It doesn't necessarily mean, it, well, if we've seen it in our past history, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the target would be shifted, but is is the right leader going to lead us in? And it's a very it's a very good question. And ultimately, I it is the membership who decides who the leader is. Correct. So if the membership is putting forward, okay, well we'll talk about what this national councillor did. So he said, and which is strange because it's an executive party member. They're kind of govern the party. So he inserted himself and said, okay, we want a leadership review. Yes. He said, we want an early leadership review. He launched a petition, garnered some support from folks within the party, uh, or at least was trying to, and it caused a stir, naturally. And then I think he got turfed or put on leave temporarily or something. Put on leave. And frankly, I do believe that that was the right move. The only reason I support it is because, again, I firmly believe that this is a time for us to continue applying pressure to liberals and to other parties, not to, again, focus the target internally. I understand when people say, look, I was displeased. I don't think my voice was reflected properly. No problem. Constitution says that you will have your, your day in court, if you will, in 2023. Okay, so this first attempt, if you will, because I'm going to assume people are working in concert here, but this first <laughs> attempt failed, and now there has been a new petition launched, but by a conservative senator, or shall I say a former conservative senator. Tell us what happened. Yeah, so Senator Batters, she also put forward a petition very similar to what the, the National Council member had put forward. And we've seen a recent termination, which has been all over the media in the last, I'd say, well, week Well, she's still so. a senator. She just, I guess, was removed from the Conservative caucus. Exactly. Because conservative senators who are appointed as conservatives kind of sit together, if you will. Yes. Uh, and now she's kind of an independent. As an independent, if you will. Right. And so 
Was that right? Was that just? I mean, you know, she's a party member herself. Uh, what was the reasoning behind why she should be turfed? I think much in the same of what we were just talking about. You have people who are sitting back watching all of this unfold and saying, look, I hear you. I understand that you want to be heard. I understand that you want to share your displeasure with uh, the leader's performance, with the election strategy. But I think what we've got to focus on is the fact that the Constitution provides a time for that to happen in 2023. So if you are- Because that's the next convention. That's the next convention. Why, yeah. So if you're going to move outside of that and you're going to work in silos and you're going to be doing these other maneuvers that frankly harm the party, you're going to have other people from other factions who are going to be upset by that, naturally. Okay, we're going to unpack this a bit further when we return from this commercial break. Please stick around. Do you want to understand what's happening in the politics of it all, the politics behind the scenes? You're probably saying, no, no, I don't. But you actually should pay attention because what happens does have an impact on federal governance and policy, and provincial for that matter. And joining me to help us understand is Vonnie Sweetland. Vonnie, before we went to commercial, we were discussing how there is an active petition put forward by a now independent conservative senator, Denise Batters. She was removed from caucus. She was removed from caucus as, as a senator, but she has put forward a petition prior to her removal that she would like a leadership review. She doesn't want to wait till the next convention. It was Correct. very convenient, I'll use convenient in quotes, for there to have been a federal policy convention in 2021, right before the federal election. And now Aaron O'Toole will, might, like if, if everything goes according to plan, he will get a second kick at the can because you can't have a convention that quickly uh, or you don't have to for at least two years in the party. Yes, yes. Well, look, I'll just say this. We know that Senator Batters has come out into the media, on social media, and she has basically unveiled all of her feelings, which is fine. If some people want to use Twitter as a, a journal, <laughs> have at it. But she did say one thing that I think we need to provide some context around. Sure. She had stated that the leader had removed her from caucus, terminated her, if you will, by voicemail. And she was very upset about this. When we actually found out later that the leader had called her several times to try to have an in-person conversation with her over the phone and she didn't answer those calls and oh. so he left a voicemail this was upsetting to her and she said look I was left a voicemail well you know what answer your phone <laughs> okay well at least the leader tried to call her I didn't even get back <laughs> yes well you know what exactly and I just said my take on it was take your voicemail and be happy with that. Some of us might say, well, look. Well, no, but I, I, can see, I can see why she would be frustrated. And not with the voicemail. I think that's a red herring. That's not of, of but what here what it comes down to is the leader selected by the members. Ultimately, it's the members who yes. are the party. It's the members get to decide. This is not a dictatorship. That is not the way this party's set up. It seems reasonable to me that the membership is concerned having to wait two full years for another, well, I guess now a year and a half, for another leadership review uh, usually elections are every four years. We're in a minority. Is it unreasonable for, for if enough members and with the mechanism within the party say, you know what, I would really like a chance to review the leadership. And who knows, maybe Aaron O'Toole will survive that and everything will, we, people can go back to business and we can, the sooner we get this dealt with, the better. Or maybe not. Or maybe they'll say, you know what, we, we actually want to try someone else. I hear even there's some people trying to organize already for a federal leadership run. So <laughs> I, I, I read the tea leaves for me. Well, look, I'll just say this. I don't think all of the membership feels that way. In fact, we know this first attempt failed because there are not that many members who feel this way. I do believe it's a small group who are, are working in a silo and they do not reflect the entire membership. So that is why people are saying, look, we don't want this right now. We want to be focused on the things that are actually affecting Canadians, like inflation, mm -hmm. like the fact that people are not able to put food on the table for their families, like the fact that the pandemic has stretched everybody extremely thin. Conservatives want to focus on those very hard-hitting issues and deliver for Canadians. They don't want to be focused on a leadership review after they just had one. So are there some people who feel this way? Sure. And that's natural after an election loss. Is it an overwhelming amount of people? Absolutely not. Okay, but this same kind of leadership review concept can be applied almost to any party. We yes. may, they may not have the same mechanism, but it exists. Let's take a survey of the land. Maybe Justin Trudeau won't be the prime minister leading uh, or the leader of the party into the next election. Maybe the NDP will say, you know what, Jagmeet, you've had two kicks at the can, didn't really do much there, we're going to have to turf you. Yeah. We've seen the Greens. The, they've already turfed their leader. She resigned. She yes. resigned. But there was so much turmoil before yes. and during that election. Well, the likelihood is that she would have been turfed. This is Annamie Paul. Yes, Annamie Paul likely would have been turfed had she not resigned. 
And I think that's why, the, well, I shouldn't say that's why, I don't want to speak for her, but that was part of what went into her decision. I think she just felt, look, this is inevitable anyways. I'm displeased as it stands. I'm going to step down. Tell us what happened with Anna Mae Paul, because some people may have been aware that there were lawsuits in the party yes. with her and the party heading into the federal election. There was a lot of discontent. It kind of clouded the whole election for the Greens, and they really uh, underperformed, if you will. Uh, in the minute we have left before commercial, could you give us a sense as to what was happening? And we could pick it up even after commercial, but what happened with the Greens? Well, look, for the purpose of time, you said we've got 60 seconds. I'll say this. The but Greens, we can have it after the commercial. The Greens shot it. themselves in the foot. Oh. <laughs> Greens shot themselves in the foot. It was a consequential election. A lot of people were able to put their egos and themselves before party. And unfortunately, you've seen the party unravel. Okay, but she, what was this lawsuit before the election? There was a lawsuit between Anime and the party because she wanted funds. She wanted funds to be able to actually run a successful national campaign, and the party didn't want to give her that. At least that was part of it. Wow. So she had to take action against the party so she could do her job as leader. Maybe that's what contributed to, to the, the bad polling. We're going to pick up this discussion when we return in a few minutes because I still want to explain a little bit more as to what happened with Green Party leader Anime Paul. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're wrapping up our discussion on the politics, especially federal past, uh, post-election rather. And joining me again is Vonnie Sweetland. Vonnie, again, you know, lawsuits with the leader of the Green Party, Anami Paul. Uh, she wasn't given funds, allegedly. A uh, lot of turmoil, uh, issues regarding uh, Semitism were brought to the surface. Yeah. Was she treated fairly? In my opinion, absolutely not. I think it depends on who you talk to. I think at the end of the day, she came forward, put herself on a very large platform to say, I want Canadians to be able to see themselves in their elected officials and leaders. She certainly did a good job of that just by putting her name forward. However, there are people within the Green Party who clearly were not ready to support Annie Paul. And uh, I'm not going to get into specifically why, because again, I don't want to speak for anyone. Sure. But I will say that former leader Jim Harris came out in the media and said, look, uh, Annie Paul is simply pulling the race card. And I thought that was very upsetting. Inappropriate, perhaps. Inappropriate. Inappropriate, yeah. for sure. Inappropriate. Because my only exposure is probably like most Canadians, as we saw her perform at two debates, one French, one English. And I thought she did a phenomenal job. I thought, hey, here's a woman who can put forward a plan very coherently. I liked her policy against the vaccine mandates near the end, because I'm against the vaccine mandates. Uh, I thought that was really great. It spoke to a lot of wide-ranging issues. But you could see something was missing, not with her, but you could see the party, there was something lacking there. They just didn't run the, the it was a lackluster campaign. Well, look, and it was a lackluster campaign because they didn't have the funds that they needed to run a successful campaign, which is why I think it was unfair for Jim Harris and others to come out and say, Enemy Paul did a really poor job and that's why we don't want her as leader anymore. Look, I would do a very poor job as well if you threw me to the wolves and didn't give me any resources to be able to defend myself. So at the end of the day, I think, you know, they really tied her hands behind her back. They didn't give her what she needed. And as a result, the Greens did very disappointing. And she She's moved on to greener pastures, so to speak. So she's done. Now they're, in, they're going to have a leadership review. Yes. We'll have to keep our eye to see what happens there. So the Conservatives might be in a leadership review. The Greens are in leadership review. Do we think there will be one with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau? All I'll say is when I had last heard from speaking with insiders, and this was some time ago, the thinking was if Justin Trudeau was no longer going to be leading the party, the second runner-up would be Christia Freeland. If that is still the case, I'm not sure. I know that her name was floated, and I think it's very possible that we could see a new leader of the Liberal Party as well. Okay, lots to happen in a couple of years. But we have elections happening soon. So in the province of Ontario, uh, conservative, progressive conservative Premier Doug Ford will be going to the polls scheduled on June 2nd, 2022. Yes. Uh, his approval rating is so-so, uh, kind of scathed by, <laughs> by the pandemic, if you will. Uh, what's happening there? I mean, obviously, I don't think there'll be a leadership review like last time, right before the election. Uh, <laughs> but what do you see in the forecast for Ontario, uh, the Ontario election? 
look, I see a June 2022 election that is definitely going to be hard fought. These poll numbers are starting to become a lot closer than they were even just a month ago. I think Doug is going to have to really come out swinging. It's not going to be as easy of an election as I think some formally thought it was going to be. That said, I do not feel Andrea Horwath, who has had a kick at the can God, I can't even count how many times is up to the up for the job. Uh, Stephen Del Duca, who is leading the Liberals, is a, a terrible decision, a terrible choice for Ontarians. And so, given the leaders that we have to presently choose from, I do believe that if I were going to go and vote tomorrow, it would be for the current premier. Well, recent ECOS polling showed that it's all, about a three-way race, which is interesting. And you always want to know who's going to cut up the middle when it's a three-way race. Yeah. I, I think uh, my prediction is that the Conservatives will bleed all over the GTA. I think what happened in that previous election was almost a one-hit wonder. People, it, it was like, definitely we don't want Kathleen Wynne. People had enough about Liberals her. Liberals were at their weakest point. Yes. But, you know... People also have to remember that Stephen Del Duca was a part of the Kathleen Wynne cabinet, Mm -hmm. and the Liberals had the run of the roost for 15 years, and they did a very poor job towards the end, as we can see. So I just say to people, do you want to go back right to where you previously were just a few short years ago? I think the answer to that should be a resounding no. No, Some might argue that not much has actually changed in the past four years, but I know uh, all these things will be duked out in the upcoming campaign. Now, we have only half a minute. I've heard rumors that they could actually go early, that the election could be actually sooner than June 2nd. And they have that within their power to drop the writ when they like. Yes. Do you, are you hearing this? Do you think we'll have an earlier election than June 2nd? I've heard it. Do I think that it's true? No. I mean, at the end of the day, I don't have to tell you I'm preaching to the choir. You hear all <laughs> sorts of things in politics. But at the end of the day, I do not think it's going to happen, I, mainly because I don't think it benefits anybody. When somebody moves to make that kind of decision, right. usually it's because it's a benefit. I don't see a benefit here. So I think the election will be in June. Thank you, Vani. This has been CounterPoint, and we'll see you next time.